your word. You kind of, kind of have that attitude when we think about the word of God. I mean, it's, it's a good thing that God reveals himself to us through scripture. There's nothing hidden. Yeah. And if there is, then there's the Holy Spirit's there to, to show us and reveal it to us. So good. Well, I was thinking, I, I've been reading a lot of different uh, kids' books recently, you know, uh, <laughs> in my recent uh, new life. Uh, so there's all sorts of fun things that I'm learning about Dr. Seuss and all the different rhyming that he does. And there's some, uh, some neat stories and adventures. There's a book, uh, there's a book without pictures that Denver really likes to, to read. Have you guys ever um, read the book without pictures? No? Oh. Uh, you guys should come over to the comments. Denver would love for you to read the book without pictures. Uh, one of the books that I was reading recently uh, was a book called Alexander's Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Is that a one that brings about anybody? Okay. That one may be a little bit familiar. So, so little Alexander has a terrible, horrible, really bad, no good day. And, and it goes throughout this hilarious thing. One of them is the uh, fall asleep with gum in his mouth. And so when he wakes up the next morning, the gum is in his hair, and so, you know, it starts off with the day pretty bad. He goes to the dentist, and he, while he's at the dentist, he finds out that he has a cavity. I mean, it's a really, really bad day. You know, go to the dentist, you find out you have a cavity. And he gets on the elevator, and then a terrible thing happens. He gets his foot stuck in the elevator. You know, it's just like, it, it repeats his whole, whole day. It's like, yeah, that poor kid. <laughs> That's a tough thing to go through. Um, he gets called on at school and to count, and he leaves out a number in the sequence. And I'm just like, man, it's an embarrassing thing. I, I was kind of one of those people when I was in school, they called on people to read. I'm like, no, not me, not me, not me, not me. Was that anybody else in the room? Like, yeah, it's just like, I don't want to be the one that misses the word or mispronounces it or like totally skips over a section. I've done that before when I'm reading in, uh, in school. But I was, while I was reading the, reading the book, I was like, yeah, I totally. I like identify with that. There's been days where I'm like going through the, the day, or sometimes, I'll be honest, it lasts like a week. It's like everything is going like, okay, this isn't right, this isn't right, okay, this happened too. Okay, I made it, it's Saturday. Hopefully next week doesn't go the same, right? <laughs> We've been to those. And I, I was reminded of a time in scripture also where this happens, and looking at the story of Job. Uh, so let's turn to the book of Job this morning. We've been going through a series called Not Alone. And uh, there are days that I have and weeks that I have sometimes when I'm like, whew, this is, this is a tough stuff. And then, I, and then I'm reminded of Job, and, and it's, it's so many of them talk about not being alone. Job has a really terrible, not so good, bad day, or a period of time, right? And Hopefully, a good thing is Job had friends. I, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm in those kind of situations, I really like uh, giving family family members a call, or I'll, I'll talk to Rachel. Maybe I have a good friend from college named Ryan, and uh, I call up Ryan. Hey, Ryan, I'm having a really terrible, uh, horrible type of day. And it's really good to have those people around me that will encourage me and uplift me. And Job had some really meet friends too, but let's, let's read and let's look a picture, take a, uh, a picture, snapshot of how this goes for Job. So Job, we're in kind of chapter one, and uh, I, am, I am going to kind of briefly summarize portions of Job's story um, today, because the story of Job really lasts the whole book, and I'm not going to get into 42 chapters of, of a story this morning. That would be a lot of reading, and I might skip over a few words, right? So... <laughs> One person got that. That was good as a reference. I don't know. Job chapter one. <laughs> Job was a really, a really blessed man, right? Uh, we read just the introduction of Job. Uh, Job chapter one. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. His possessed, he possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. I like that. There's no, there's no number there. Just a ton of people that work for him. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one of his day. And they would send and invite 
my three sisters and eat and drink with them. You get this picture that they have a really great friend. They ate together. They uh, each day they planned it. They had a feast. They would invite people in. I mean, they had plenty. I don't know what it's like to own 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoked oxen, and 500 female donkeys. But I'm just imagining what kind of land mass that, that, would, that he would need to have to, to, be able to, to be able to host that many animals within the 500 pairs of oxen. I mean, that means there's, there's that much work that had to be done. So there was that much fields that he had. Uh, and this, this, this Job, he was, he was a man. But it says here, he was the greatest of all the people in the East. I mean, he, he was steady. And you, you read this story, and right after this setup of uh, what it looked like to be in Job's house, and, and all of the blessings that he had, all this greatness and all this blessings, that he was a man who feared God, uh, immediately in the story, things begin to change. Uh, it, it, within the first three chapters of the book of Job, he loses everything. I mean, like, like everything. His house gets collapsed, his fields, uh, and grain he loses, his cattle he loses, his family he loses, his wife gets so upset, he's like, you should just curse God because he obviously, had, you have lost favor with him. Just curse him. I mean, like, everything. Then not only was it his possessions, it was his health. His health starts failing. He gets sick. He gets boiled. He's sitting there all, all alone, in trouble, just like, Complaining, he did chapter chapter three. I guess not a complaint. I don't know. If I was in, if, <laughs> I think if I lost everything, I think I might have a complaint or two. I don't know. Um, so I'm not going to fault Job in that. But he, I mean, he laments even being bored. He's like, why has all this calamity come to me? And thankfully for Job, he has some friends. That's how many guys know this story. Yeah. He has some friends that's there with them. And I mean, I, I'm reading, I'm reading. I want to encourage you, maybe this could be our church reading for the week. Read the book of Job. But from chapter 4 through 31, it's Job with his friend. And, you know, like I said earlier, and maybe you guys have the same thing, you know, when I'm having a really bad, horrible day, I know there's some people that I call, or people that visit, or people that are around me, and I'm like, that, I really enjoy the fact that I can have your company, because you're going to, I know, when I call Ryan, first, every time I call Ryan, the first thing he says is, I love you, that's how he answers the phone, I love you, oh. like, man, it's just like, it's so good, it, 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 it lifts me up, right? Job's friends had a different version of encouragement. <laughs> I don't know if they read that book, how to uplift, uh, you know, how to encourage one another daily. So as their, their best friend just lost his home, lost his family, lost his, his uh, all of his sons and his daughters, his wife, everybody leaves him, all of his animals, all of his wealth, his health, everything. And he's not alone because he has three friends to come. But the basic message of the friends is this. Suffering is basically a punishment for sin. You must be sinning. Your children must be sinning. There's something wrong with you before God because there's certainly not, you are certainly not a man who follows after God for all of these things that happen to you. And then they get rid of Prosperity is a reward for the righteous. And this is, this is the way that they come and encourage Job. I don't know about you, when I'm having a horrible, terrible, not so great day, and somebody comes to me and it's like, you must be sinning. <laughs> Man, there's something wrong with you. What is, what is going on in your life? This is, this is all. And there is time, like I said, I love the Lord's rebuke, and you know, he can correct me. And, and, but I need some comfort. I don't know what, I need, some, I need somebody to encourage me and uplift me. If in Job chapter 22, verse 5, this is how, this is how, um, this is, this is how the message is summed up. Job chapter 22, 5. Is your wickedness great? <laughs> I don't feel encouraged this morning. I've been like, Brian, I'm sorry, I won't hang up the phone right now. This is, this is just too much for me. I know. If we are to be a church where we say, hey, we are not alone, we know, we sang a song this morning that God is with us, so I mean, we have Him, He's with us, but as a family,
family of believers, we're going to say, no, we are sticking together. We're, we're going to be for each other. We're not against each other. No, we're going to be ones that encourage each other and lift each other up. We're going to be ones that when somebody falls, we're there to pick them up. If we're, uh, if we're facing some kind of obstruction, we're not going to stand alone so that we're torn apart. But no, we're going to come together as a core of three strands and be strong. Then we're going to have to learn how to be with each other when stuff happens. Because in life, stuff happens. And what we need people to do is come alongside of us and point us to the truth of who God is so that the unbelief in our heart and the difficult situations don't speak louder than the truth of God's word. In Job, they, his friends, they, they get it all wrong. <laughs> They don't know how to speak the truth of God to Job in such a way as going to lift him up and point him to, his, to the truth. Instead, it, it diminishes him and, and really gets him confused until God steps in and begins to speak the truth of who God is to Job. And this morning and this series is all about not being alone because we have each other. And remember, we turned to each other and said, hey, I need you and you need me. And the reason why we need each other is so that we can speak the truth of God to each other so that we are encouraged and uplifted and built up instead of left in our miserable, no good, terrible day, right? So let's look here at Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 13. We're going to take a little bit of time and we're going to examine Hebrews chapter 3 uh, together and then we're going to go into some application. Hey, what is it going to look like as a church if we are dedicated to and intentional about being better than Job's three friends? Uh, we're going to be intentional about, hey, encouraging one another, one another, building each other up in the truth of God so that we can be encouraged by God's word. So Hebrews, let's go there. Hebrews chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse number 13 to start with. It says this. Hebrews chapter, I was in chapter, chapter 13, sorry. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. It says this. But exhort, I want to say, but encourage one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the, by the deceitfulness of sin. One of the difficult things when, I'm, uh, when I look at Job's friends or when I'm hearing encouragement from other people, sometimes they are, they are very much convinced that what they're speaking to me is the truth. I mean, it, uh, on the surface level, it kind of sounds decent that Job's friend would say to him, uh, that, that suffering is a punishment for sin and prosperity uh, is a reward for righteousness. It kind of sounds good. Anybody maybe have a, a couple other churchy things in, in their mind that, that kind of sounds good. You know, oh, when we're going through suffering and, and, and hard times and trials, it, somebody used to speak to us all the time. Rachel and I were going through the hard thing. And I say, don't worry, God won't give you something you can't handle. And I'm like, that sounds kind of good, but I don't know if that applies right now. Like, I'm just like, this is a lot. This is good. I, I don't think I can handle this. And maybe there's going to be some times we'll, we'll go as a church and we'll go through some of those things we always hear or always spoken to us and why, hey, those aren't actually what the, the scripture is talking about. I think we'll probably do a whole, a whole series on that. There's, there's a lot of them. But we should encourage one another so that sin's deceitfulness doesn't harden our hearts. There's some things that sound good, there's some things that, that may be good, and it actually hardens our heart to the truth of who God is. It, it creates us an unbelieving heart about who God is, and, and that causes us to miss out on what God has for us. So let's read then this verse, verse 13, in its context, and it even expounds on this even more, that there's something that God has for us uh, that we miss out when we aren't encouraging each other in the truth of who God is. Let's read this. Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 12, it says, this, Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But encourage one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, 
For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. I'm having a terrible, no good day. I'm in need of some encouragement. Why? So that I don't have an unbelieving heart leading me to fall away from God. I and mean, that's why when I had you guys repeat to each other, man, I need you and you need me. Why? Is because I know that apart from the truth of God being spoken into my life, then there's, an, uh, there's a propensity to me to harden my heart or turn my way or for my evil heart or for my evil self to, to not believe the truth about who God is. I need, you need, this constant reminder of who God is, so that my heart towards Him stays in this position of belief. So what I loved about reading Job's story is he was determined not to curse God. It was miserable. He admitted he didn't understand what was going on, but he was determined, I am not going to curse and turn away from God. And in my life and in our life as we walk this road after God, and our determination, our intentions in our lives, I believe in this room, I know some of you guys, right? I mean, is that we would not turn away from God. We would not be, in, we would not be disturbed by God. We would not curse that We would not uh, have an unbelieving heart, but we have a desire that we would, our heart would be full of belief, we would have a heart that is fully after God. And so we need one another. Look at verse 14. For we have come as for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. This, this talks about in, in, in its entirety a journey that we are on with God. For those of us that our, our faith has led us to believe fully on Christ. There is an end hope that we all have, a unity with Christ forever, a, a, a hope that we can celebrate and look forward to, that in Christ, when we stay in Christ, that we're embedded in Him, that there is a hope and a future for us that doesn't just exist here on earth, but exists when heaven and earth come together and we are united with Christ. That is our eternal hope, right? And so our responsibility between the moment that we receive Christ and said, yes, and to the moment where we realize that and our hope is made new and we, we are united with Christ, there's this journey in between that we together are on, that our hearts, we must not harden our hearts toward, toward belief on God, but that together we would encourage another, one another, stay true to God, believe on His truth. Believe on His Word. Believe in Christ. He, he is there for forgiveness of sin. You are not alone. We can sing that, sing that song to one another. You are not alone. God is with you. And these truth that we find in His Word then encourage us and build us up. And it says here, keeps us to the end. So what if we were to commit ourselves to one another? Commit ourselves to this truth. To seeing each other receive the hope that Christ has for us. I believe it would look like strength. It would look like overcoming. And it would look like victory. It would look like moving forward. It would look like Christ. As a body. I want us to be determined that none of us would have unbelieving hearts. That's what this is all about. That's what it's not alone. That's what this family is all about. That we would be determined that none of us would have unbelieving hearts, but that we would encourage one another daily to follow after Him and live after Him. And so as a body, we've been talking about for a while, if you've been through the all-in course, our membership course, we've been talking about and, and had this as a vision of the church, that we would start uh, what we are going to call DNA groups. But if, if, if our goal is that we would encourage one another on a regular basis, then we, we have to make a space in our lives for this to happen. Right? It doesn't just happen on accident. Here, my house never gets cleaned on accident. 
Uh, but you're right. Things don't get put in order on accident. No, they take some intentionality, some effort, some sacrifice to say, no, it is going to be a value of mine that I'm going to encourage my, my fellow believers. I'm going to encourage my brother or my sister in Christ. And so as a church, we said, yes, we want this to be an intentional uh, part of our uh, fellowship, an intentional part of our organization of the church it is that we would have groups of three or four people meeting together on a regular basis to encourage one another so that sin's deceitfulness does not harm each other's heart, but we're able to speak the truth to one another in love and build one another up so that we would look more like Christ. And when we have an, um, uh, a terrible, uh, no good, ugly kind of day, man, there's somebody we can call up and say, hey, and on the other end, they answer, man, I love you. And follow after Jesus. Yeah, man, the encouragement in Christ. God has your back. And a DNA group is designed to help that happen. It's to encourage one another on a regular basis to believe the truth. You say, Andrew, what is it? What does, I've had this discussion with other pastors and we, we other churches, and talk about what does discipleship look like in the church, man, we believe wholeheartedly that every individual in this church is responsible for making disciples. Everybody smile about that. <laughs> yeah. Every one of us is responsible for helping each other come to know Christ more. If we read through Scripture, we can't be obedient to the New Testament Scriptures without saying, I need you and you need me. Let's journey after Jesus together. Because there's a real enemy uh, out there trying to, to seek and destroy us. But you know what? We're on God's team together, and we've got each other back, and we're going after Jesus. I'm not going to allow these worries of the world to harden my heart. No, we're going to use the wisdom of God and, and apply it to our lives in such a way that it changes what we do. And so today, we're not alone. We have each other. And together, we can encourage one another to follow after Jesus. And we believe we're going to implement these three steps together. We're going to learn how to discover truth about who God is. We're going to nurture one another. And we're going to, uh, we're going to make decisions on how we can act in following that discovery. So today I want to go through these three points of how this all works together. How do we not end up like Job with a whole bunch of friends around us that, that don't know the truth of God and are encouraging us to follow up through him, right? Uh, how are we going to be committed to one another so that we're encouraged and that our hearts are, are full of unbelief so that we, we don't uh, follow after God and receive the hope that he has for us? Why? It starts with us discovering who God is. And when I say discovering who God is, that starts with the basics of knowing the gospel. So when I read my scriptures every week, and I, I'm discovering who God is, right? And we've been encouraging that we as a church value the word of God. It's like honey. It's like a sweet tasting dessert. And so part of this process is going to be that we together as a body, we're discovering God's word. And we're asking two important questions. We're asking who God is and what he's doing in the scripture. Who God is and what he's doing. That is, at the basic level, what the gospel is. Who God is and what he's doing. We know that Jesus, I want to repeat a bunch of lines from the last few sermons, but it's, it's intentional and it's on purpose. Now, we know that Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. So the gospel is the great news that, that we have a heavenly Father who loves us and is in, in crazy love with us, who rescued us through his son and redeemed us to right standing with him, right? And this is good news. And we see this not only in who God is, but what he's done. We can't just say God is loving, right? We read that in uh, Psalms 117. It said God is loving and his love endures forever. We don't just know that because it says it in scripture. We, we can see that in who he is, but we see it because of what he did in Jesus. It's the gospel. So together we're going to be committed in these DNA groups, we're going to be committed to discovering God. Who God is confirmed by what he did. So when we read scripture, we're going to ask that, ask that question to ourselves. Who is God in this scripture? And what is he doing in this passage that is confirming that truth about him? 
And as we do this, we're going to grow to know the truth. That the truth of God will be planted in us, and it will transform us. It will renew our minds. We'll begin to think like God. And I pray in a prayer that we'll begin to act like God as we discover who He is. Sometimes in Scripture I, I, I'm reading, and not only do I get to know who God is and, and what He's doing, and how that, how that encourages me to see Him, see him for who He truly is, but also I see myself in Scripture. Sometimes it reveals what I should be doing, where I should be going, who I am, and what God thinks about me. And sometimes that challenges up against the belief in my heart. If I talk about being uh, having a hard heart, and I've met so many people that that don't know that, okay, don't believe that they're a child of God. Well, how, how do I know, Andrew? How do you know that people don't believe they're child? They know they are. But their view of God is, is one that he is far off and distant, and that he actually isn't like a father who is close and loving and comfortable with us. Right? And it affects the way they pray, it affects the way they live. Uh, and, and man, I, I remember when we were going through this with one of my groups at Purdue University, I had a friend named Radon and Yuri, and we used to get together uh, on a regular basis and read the scriptures together. And man, Radon had, Radon had a tough life and, and came from a family that there wasn't, there wasn't that affection and there wasn't that love. And so when he viewed God, man, he viewed God as one that was disciplined and angry at us. So man, every time we came together for, uh, for a time of discipleship, he was always like super, like over-confessing everything that was happening in his life. And it was like, it was like there's like, this sin, and this sin, and this sin, and this sin, and oh God, please go, like, it was, it was as if, man, he, he was ready for God's punishment, he was always, um, like, wallowing in, in sorrow because of how many ways that he disappointed God, and, and didn't feel like he deserved God's love, and affection, and acceptance, but as a child of God, that I know, I am secure, when that belief and that truth gets into my heart, I see God for who He is by what He's done, that He is a loving Father that is in pursuit of me, and so much so that He sent His Son to die in my place when I wasn't worth anything to Him, but only for Him to adopt me as His child. Man, when that truth is in my heart, now my heart no longer is hardened in that area, and I begin to see right on the extent now He knew, He had confidence, I am a child of God, and though I may have wronged Him, and I may have sinned, man, when I approach Him, I no longer have to be so worried of that hard hand coming down on, on top of me. No, I can rest in assurance that I am with Him, and He is mine, and I'm secure in that. So I confess things to Him. Yes, I confess it in such a way that I need His forgiveness, but I understand, me and Him, there's nothing that's going to change my position with Him. I am His Son, and He loves me. And that's the type of work that we do when we talk about we're going to discover God together. We're going to discover who He is and what He really thinks about us. We're going to discover who He is and what He has done for us to confirm that. And so, we can encourage one another in those truths. We've got to be ones that are dedicated to discovering God together so that we can encourage one another so that our hearts are not hardened but that we receive these truths. Because the second part of our groups is just that that I explained. We're going to nurture one another. We're going to discover God together, and we're going to nurture one another. You know, what would it have been like if Job's friends came to him and just sat with him and encouraged him in the truth? And God has not forgotten about you, Job. God has not left you, Job. And Job, God is in control. Let me speak some truth into your heart. That's what I mean by nurturing one another. That together we're going to discover who God is and what He's done, and we're going to speak the truth to each other. We're going to pray for one another's situation. We're going to be for each other and not against each other. We're going to be in the mud together. We're going to be in the ugliness and speaking truth to one another in such a way that then we see God and we go after it and we cling to that. But it doesn't just end there, right? And we just start, if we just stuck with, with discovering who God is and just 
went through the speaking the truth to one another, nurturing one another, and, and encouraging one another, building one another up in Christ, I mean, we would be halfway there. The second, the, the last part of that is acting out the truth that we just seen. So, man, with my, with my buddy Radon, we, we were able to talk with him, and we got to see how this truth transformed his life. So now we saw confidence, not just in when he was talking to God, he was like, man, he, confessing sins in a way that, was, that wasn't full, so full of shame and so full of, of, of hatred of himself, but no, this confidence, no, I can come to God and be loved and care for him. Then we started seeing that outside of outside of those prayer times, when he was going and he was witnessing. And man, like, as we began to speak these truths and encouragement to him, in his confidence building, he started leading people to the Lord on the bus and in the in the union and all over all over campus. And he just all of a sudden knew the truth. And it was so good that when he saw other people that were going through hard times and they were depressed and they were lonely and feeling like nobody was on their side, and he was able to sit next to him on the bus and just be able to speak the truth that God had spoken to him. And his, his whole actions of his life changed because he received the truth. I am a child of God, and God loved me, and he's for me, he's not against me. So we act different. Now, when we understand, when we begin to discover in God's word, and, and like, like when I read the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, Right, and, and Peter gets there and, and he goes to wash Peter's feet and he's like, Lord, no, like you are my you are my teacher. I, I respect you. Wait, you cannot wash my feet, right? And Jesus replies to, to Peter and he, and he tells him, um, if you don't allow me to do this to serve you in this way, you have no part in me. Peter's response is like, Well, wash my whole body. I mean, I mean dump the whole thing on me, wash my whole body, right? And as, as this truth began to speak to me, and I see Jesus as a servant, one that came to serve. He, he served, he didn't come to be served, but he came to serve. And he did that in his whole life, not even, well, I haven't even thought about, or haven't even got to the point of thinking about, man, the end of his, end of the story, right, where Jesus dies and serves me in that way, just in the way that he is serving people beforehand, speaks to me in such a way that now I understand, man, I, that's why I always tell people, man, you don't have to call me pastor, like, don't call me, you can just call me Andrew, you know, I, I, I just want to be the normal person, they just serve, right, Jesus, I see Jesus as like, this rabbi, savior of the world, messiah, teacher, and he's like, putting on a waist, a waist, uh, cloth, so that he can wash people's feet, you know, like, now, when I think about other people in need, I'm not thinking about myself. I'm like, man, how can I just serve? How can I just serve people around me? It changes how I act. It will change how we act as a church as we discover who God is, as we're built up and encouraged one another in these truths. Our actions will begin to change. We'll see people. Man, I love talking with my. You guys got to meet some of my friends yesterday, and uh, he always. One of my good Chinese friends here, he, he always comments about how I'm with Denver. Like, it's like, Andrew, you are you're so patient with Denver, you know? And I'm, I'm not patient with Denver. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. You know, that is not me, right? The only, the, what you are seeing is, is not me. It is Christ in me. The truth that I, I begin to see about who God is, that God is patient with me. And I see that, that, man, every time I sin and I come to him, he still forgives me. Like, he doesn't even know I'm just going to go and do the same. But he's still there and he's going to forgive me. And he's going to be patient with me. And he's going to encourage me. And he's going to lift me up. And so now when I'm thinking about my son, and sometimes it's not... <laughs> I lack patience sometimes. And But I'm reminded of who God is and what he's done for me. And now when I'm acting towards Denver, I'm acting as... As if Christ has affected my life. Right? That's the whole thing about how we can evangelize too. It's not us, it's God in us that's showing these good things, right? But this is what we're committing to as a church. We're committing to each other's hearts, not being hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We're committing to speaking the truth to each other with what we find in Christ, what we're discovering in Christ, so that our life looks different. 
that our life begins to look like Christ. And so every time uh, we talk about DNA groups, it is a group of three or four people that are committed to looking more and more like Christ. Committed to encouraging one another in Christ. Committed to acting like Christ. And this happens as we journey together. As we get together on a regular basis and discover what God is speaking to us. As we take that intentional time to speak into one another's life. And as we intentionally say, how is my life going to be different in response to this truth? That may be the hardest one. But it's the necessary step, right? The Word of God in James says, don't just be hearers of the Word only. So these aren't groups that are designed just to hear the Word. It's not a group for one of, one of the people to come and just speak the whole time and, and come with a prepared message to, to share like Sunday morning. This gathering has a purpose. But these smaller gatherings have a purpose in that we are speaking the truth to one another. That each one of us are encouraged and each one of us are held to act as Christ is revealed to us. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we open our series with this uh, chapter, and it, it said, you know, that two can produce more. Two are better than one. Uh, a cord that's a uh, three strands is not easily broken. But in that Ecclesiastes 4, verse 10, it also says this. Uh, I love it. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 10. For if one falls down, this is again in that concept of having having another person with you. For if one falls down, his companion will lift him up. I love scripture because it also not only speaks the truth of encouragement, it also speaks some rebuke and correction too. It says this, and some warning, it says this, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and does not have another to lift him up. It's dangerous to be alone. It is, when, we, when we are alone, we're susceptible to uh, deceit in our life, we're susceptible to the works of the enemy. When we're alone, we're isolated in the darkness rules. We talked about that last week, that, hey, coming to Jesus is, is a coming to exposure. Woe to those who are alone and the other half of the to lift them up. And I am convinced that as a body of believers, we need each other. I've been praying for four weeks now, or more, but four weeks specifically, because this is our series, that we would be committed as a church to encouraging one another to follow after Jesus, to submit to Him in all areas of life, so that our lives would look like Him. And so today, I want to start, or we want to start as a, as a leadership, we want to start DNA groups as an official part of the church. What are DNA groups? Again, it's three or four individuals meeting together on a regular basis to encourage one another to follow after Jesus, to discover the Word together, to nurture one another, and to act as though Christ is leading us. And, and so today, this is how I wanted to end this sermon. I thought, you know, how can we do this? We could, like, go tell them, yeah, go do this. Go encourage one another. Go do... I said, no, you know what we need to do? We need to form some DNA groups today. We need to get three, two, uh, sorry, three or four people that are saying, yeah, I want to meet at this time. This time fits well for my schedule so that we can meet for an hour and, and do this. Discover the Word of God together, nurture one another, and act out this. And, and this is going to, these groups, we want to encourage them that they would be um, guys groups and girls groups. Why would we do that? Well, our missional communities are times that we come together in our Sunday morning times, we all come together. We're encouraging God. We're praising the Lord. We're getting, we're, we're getting the good words, and we're, and we're speaking to each other. We're serving one another in those contexts. But in a group of three or four guys, then we can get into the nitty gritty of our lives. I get to know you, I get, and you get to know me, and we get to encourage one another to act like Christ. In a group of three or four ladies, man, you guys can get to the depths of your heart in a way that men that really see transformation, really see the truth of God, get into those deep parts. And this is something that is going to take commitment. I, I, I am asking something of you as a church, and I, I know this. 
It, it requires, we are busy people. But I, I believe that if we're committed to encouraging one another in Christ, if we, uh, I believe that if we're committed to seeing one another follow after Jesus more fully in all areas of our lives, then this is going to be a step that's going to be important. This is going to be a sacrifice that is worth it to get up. Uh, like I, I tried to meet with Kerr on, on Friday morning and I didn't set my alarm. Right. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take commitment to say, you know, I want to get up and meet with Kerr at 545 on a, on a Friday morning. And, right? It's going to take commitment. Or, hey, we're going to say, you know what? At 10 o'clock at night, I, I know at that, that, that time that works for me, I want to be able to meet. Maybe it's uh, lunchtime where, hey, we're, we're in a close enough um, the vicinity in, in town that, hey, at lunch we can meet, and for 45 minutes we're going to hash this out. Maybe, I don't know, if we get 30 minute lunches, hour lunches, but, you know, right? It, it's going to take some strategic thinking that they say, how are we going to be able to be committed to this? But I believe forming these groups are going to be important because it's going to speak to this truth. It's going to speak to our commitment to encouraging one another daily. As long as it's called the day, that sin's deceitfulness doesn't harden our hearts. That's why, that's why I'm making this big of an ask of you. This is why I, we've been focusing on this sermon, we're not alone. And because we, we have a tendency, if I'm honest with myself, to isolate myself and to work things out on my own. But the scripture, to be true to scripture, we need each other to walk this out in truth. So today, how, Andrew, how are we going to respond? Should I have you all come up here and like, like pray over you? Yeah, like pray that your schedule fits in everything. No, I think today, in clothing, what we're going to do is get together and it may be a little different than normal, but the guys on one, one side and the ladies on that side and say, hey, who can meet at what time during the week? I told you guys that uh, at the end of this uh, series, I'm going to give you guys a tool to make this happen, to make this encouraging one of us, to make this meeting stuff happen. So what am I asking for you today? Am I asking for 100% participation? I'm hoping for that. I would love that. I know it's not a reality sometimes. That, you know, sometimes things that don't work out. I think that overall, if we're committed to encouraging one another, it's going to happen. But I am asking, hey, for you guys to commit one hour a week to meet together on a regular basis. And say, hey, how can we discover what God is saying to us in, in the Word of God? How can we encourage one another, nurture us to follow after Him? And how can we act different in response to this truth? And so I, I did print out tools, and we're going to get it even more officially printed out, that I'm going to pass out to the groups. But in response, I want to encourage you, for those of you that say, yeah, I, I, I want this and I need this, and I recognize my need for this, uh, I won't force everybody to do this. But if you say, yeah, I recognize a need to meet one hour a week with some guys, or one hour a week with some girls, so that we would be encouraged and follow after Jesus, I want the guys that say that would come up here right after I pray, and we're, we'll figure out our thing, we'll figure out how this all works together. And then, ladies, I want you guys to come on this side and just figure out, hey, where are each other working? Is there, is there close proximity so that we can make this happen? And, and let's just move forward. Let's commit ourselves to encouraging one another on a regular basis to follow up to Jesus. You guys for that? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's pray. I want to pray because it is any time we make a step, we need God's grace to help us in this. Committed. So let's pray this way. Uh, Father, I, I'm grateful that we have a church that can look each other in the eye and say, I need you and you need me. And we mean it. And God, I, I, I thank you for this, uh, this step that we're going to take as a church to start forming these intentional groups that are going to be uh, intentional, intentional about encouraging one another so that our hearts are not hardened, but that they are increasingly open to receiving your truth. Father, I pray now that as we begin to form these groups, that you will naturally uh, make uh, ways for our schedules to click and for things to happen, so that we can be committed to this, so that we can be intentional about this. 
God, uh, in any new adventure in you, God, we need your grace. Father, we recognize we're not doing this alone, but God, we are doing this with your help. So, Father, Lord, I pray now for every individual. Father, Lord, that you would encourage their heart. Father, Lord, that you would speak to them and speak to ways. Father, Lord, that we can make this happen. Father, Lord, so that we can be encouraged and we can be strengthened to follow after you all the days of our lives. God, that's our purpose, Father. God, that's our goal. That's our heart. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Well, I encourage you, uh, guys, uh, let's uh, meet here. Uh, we'll figure out our schedules. Ladies, if you could uh, move over here. Everybody will get one of these so that you can even do this on your own. But we're going to figure out our schedules together and figure out, hey, how can we meet each other and be encouraged?